Welcome back to day one of the 2020 summit on what next for wireless infrastructure, hosted by the University of Surrey 5G Innovation Center in association with Telecom TV and supported by Etsy. We start our afternoon session with a presentation from Dr. Andreas Muller, Bosch Corporate Research and Chair of the 5G ACIA, entitled Industrial 5G, Remaining Challenges and Future Perspectives. Well, hello everyone. My name is Andreas Müller. I'm the Head of Communication and Network Technology in Bosch Corporate Research and at the same time the General Chair of 5G ACIA, the 5G Alliance for Connected Industries and Automation. And I have the pleasure to tell you a little bit about Industrial 5G today, so where we currently are, what remaining challenges uh, exist, and also what our future perspectives are. And as you can see from the slide, so this is a Bosch presentation, not a 5G ACIA presentation, since there we do not have a consensus view on the long-term perspective of Industrial 5G yet. So 5G has the potential to become the central nervous system of the factory of the future and to lift Industry 4.0 to the next level, um, enabling unprecedented levels of flexibility, efficiency, productivity, and also ease of use. But at the same time, it's also a very special application domain. So in many cases, we have very demanding quality of service requirements. So for many industrial applications, we need very low latencies, high reliabilities, for instance. For others, we need high data rates. If you think of HD cameras uh, that are connected using 5G. And this also shows that we have not only a single use case with a single set of requirements, but many different use cases with very diverse requirements, which also have to be supported in many cases at the very same time. The good thing is we don't need a nationwide network, but we need only a local network, local connectivity with this um, performance in a very controlled environment. So inside a factory, inside a plant, which allows uh, specific optimizations and makes certain things easier. But we also always have brownfield um, deployments in many cases. Uh, that means we have to live what we have in place today. So that's typically wired communication. In some cases, it's Wi-Fi and similar wireless stand solutions. And we have to be able to smoothly integrate a 5G network into this existing infrastructure. There are also special security requirements and security concerns. Production data is very sensitive. There are established ways how to secure a system um, we have the concept of zones and contweets, for example, and also this has to be made compatible with what 5G brings in, which has its own established ways of securing things. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters in manufacturing really is costs and is a return on invest. So no manufacturer will deploy a 5G network just because it's nice to have 5G but you will always do the math and determine the value add that the 5G network brings in and also compare it then to the costs and you need a significant return on invest in order to make this investment. Also, it's a B2B business instead of a B2C business. So that uh, comes along with various changes in the ecosystem, of course. But in general, we can say there's also a lot of value to be unlocked. And the reason for that is because simply a lot of value is generated in manufacturing. And at the same time, as I mentioned before, we only need local connectivity to unlock this potential and that makes the industrial domain very attractive from the um, investment versus gain perspective. So, but of where are we currently on this journey? Um, so the developments towards industrial 5G started about three years ago, I would say. And in the meantime, it really has become a hot topic. Everybody's talking about industrial 5G. It has become a focus topic in standardization in 3GBP. And some key capabilities already have been standardized, which I will briefly outline on the next slide. We also made good progress um, in the ecosystem development. So we've established the 5G Alliance for Connected Industries and Automation two and a half years ago, which serves as a global forum for bringing all relevant stakeholders together and for driving industrial 5G. And we have 76 members today, which includes major players from the telco industry, but also from the um, industrial domain and also, of course, some universities and so on. 
And of course, we have seen the advent of non-public networks. So for the first time, it will be possible for a manufacturer to deploy and operate such non-public networks inside a factory, which are to some extent decoupled from the public networks. Um, so this enables then a lot of new choices now for how to use 5G and also will trigger a lot of innovation because they can be targeted, tailored solutions and services now, especially for these new um, application scenarios. So many things have happened already. If we look at the standardization timeline, this is what you get. So the first uh, version of 5G, release 15 uh, of PGPP has been approved um, mid last year. Uh, and it still had a very strong focus on consumer application and enhanced mobile broadband. So if you buy 5G today, this is what you get. Then really 16 has for the first time had a very strong focus on industrial applications. This has been approved in June this year, and it includes features like ultra-reliable low latency communication, non-public networks, time-sensitive communication. That means uh, support for time-sensitive networking, TSN over 5G, and also native layer 2 transport so that we don't necessarily need the internet protocol, but we can directly transmit ethernet frames over a 5G network, which again is very important, especially for the industrial domain. Release 17 is currently underway, and it will come along with several enhancements um, of these features. It also has a stronger focus on positioning, which is, again, very important in manufacturing because knowing where things are is a very valuable information. And it will be in this new transmission mode called NR RedCap, uh, which is somewhere, somewhere in between this high-end mobile broadband uh, mode and also this low-end uh, massive machine type communication. And this might be especially suitable for um, industrial sensors, for example. And then, of course, the journey will continue with release 18, which is still um, being defined, but with a high probability, I would say it will more focus on massive IoT applications. That means tiny little sensors, for example, which have to be um, connected using very low energy and low costs, um, and that is the natural next step then. So many things have been done already towards supporting these industrial applications. But if you look at factories today, there are only very few of them which already make use of 5G. And that's because there are still some challenges to be overcome. Some of them are listed here. First of all, having the features in the standard is nice, but they also have to be implemented in the chipsets and the infrastructure components. And that still has to take some time, especially if we consider that release 16 is the first release which really has many of the features that make a difference to the industrial domain. Then we also need performance validation in real world industrial environments. And of course, these environments are different from the classical office spaces, for example. Um, and that's important because you have to have a sufficient level of trust in the performance in a real factory. And we need real business cases. So as I mentioned before, at the end of the day, only the ROI matters. Defining a use case is very easy, but defining a real business case with a positive value add of 5G, which is higher than the cost, that's a real challenge and some more work has to be done in this respect. Then also smart integration. So as also mentioned before, how can we securely and smoothly integrate a 5G network into the existing ecosystem, the existing environment? And we need also a functional market ecosystem. Um, so we have to overcome somehow the chicken egg problem that exists. Um, the question is, will there be first some factories equipped with a 5G network, or we will first see 5G-based automation devices hitting the market? One doesn't really work without the other, and therefore someone has to make the first step. Um, and this is exactly the chicken egg challenge that we have. In addition to that, there are some other concerns that I would like to briefly outline here. So it's, of course, the costs, um, which are still too high as of today in many cases. And this includes the equipment cost, operational cost, and also IP licensing costs. Also, the complexity is very high. So a 5G system is still more complex than a Wi-Fi network, for example, and also than the wire systems that they have in place today. And we have to somehow bring the complexity down and also the operational complexity. So why is it so much more uh, complex to operate a non-public network compared to a Wi-Fi network, for example? And there's a lot of potential to achieve that, for example, by offering optimized solutions, especially for the different vertical domains and also especially um, targeting at non-public networks. Also, there are some new security threats coming up, such as jamming. So we have to 
have a plan how to deal with this, how to mitigate the risk. And here the benchmark is not 4G, the benchmark is wired communication, and in some cases Wi-Fi. And we have to ensure and be able to check the trustworthiness of such a private 5G network. Because manufacturing is a very sensitive area, production data is very sensitive, and that's why you want to be sure that you can fully trust your network. Also, there are challenges on the standardization side. 3GBP is very um, complex standardization body, very resource intensive. Um, if you look at who is engaged in 3GBP, it's only the big telco players, basically, and only very, very few vertical representatives. Uh, and therefore we, therefore, we should think about ways how to reduce the complexity and how to make it easier for verticals to directly get engaged. Also, there are challenges on the regulatory side. Spectrum regulation always has been highly fragmented in different countries. It's now getting more serious if you look at these vertical applications, because industrial automation, for example, is always a global business. Domestic markets are typically too small, and therefore the need to really come to a globally harmonized solution is even more um, uh, is even higher than that it used to be before. And finally, on the energy consumption side, there's still some room for improvements from our perspective. For many industrial IoT applications, but also IoT applications in general, the energy consumption is still too high. And therefore, we should think about new ways to optimize that. Maybe if we have special devices, which are not so much targeting at the public networks, but maybe which are specifically optimized for non-public networks. So if you now look a bit further ahead, um, what may come with beyond 5G and 6G systems, um, I've put together here the top 10 aspects from my, aspect, uh, from my perspective, which are relevant here. And it shows you also a little bit our vision of what 6G will be all about. So it should be IoT first. Previous generations have always primarily focused on mobile phones and connecting people. Of course, more and more M2M applications came up, but the main focus was always on, on people and on phones. And with 6G, this should change. So that really the IoT is the primary application that should be considered and that should be optimized for. The same holds for the non-public networks. So that's something new now with 5G, but with 6G, this should be in the center point of all considerations from the very beginning so that there can be many tailored um, networks, smaller networks for specific applications. And that's probably where the potential um, of beyond 5G and 6G at the end comes from. We should make use of network automation to reduce the complexity to operate such networks, for example, to ensure high ease of use. And there's a lot of potential here. So maybe most of the innovation with beyond 5G and 6G system doesn't come from the user plane, but more if we look at the management plane and the control plane. And network automation certainly is a key component here. The same holds for the openness and modularity of the system. So the developments in this direction have already started with Open Run, the Telecom Infra project, and so on. And we think that this should be continued so that we really have a highly modular system with well-defined interfaces in between so that you can easily combine different building blocks from different vendors. And that's then an enabler to trigger innovation and to stimulate competition. And that's, of course, always nice from an end user perspective. We also should continue the developments towards a tightly integrated connectivity compute fabric so that the boundaries between the connectivity infrastructure, the cloud, the edge cloud, are basically dissolved so that more and more computation, for example, may be done directly in network devices and so on. So there's still some more potential to be unlocked here. Also, 6G will come on along with new functionalities, integrated sensing, for example, so that we can use a 6G system uh, also for radar applications, for material inspection in a factory, also for activity detection, so that we can detect if, um, if an accident has happened or something like this. And one of the most important points from my perspective is that we should also start really doing a holistic system optimization. So 5G has been optimized basically in such a way that it becomes as good as a cable. Um, and if we do it like this, then we don't have to change the application. But today, applica today's applications are like this because they were relying on a cable and knew exactly what they can rely on. But if you now do a joint optimization of the application and communication, then there is still more potential to be unlocked. And that's really something that we should do when talking about 6G. Of course, there will also be the shift towards higher frequencies to unlock large bandwidths and to also get inbuilt security due to the high penetration loss at these high frequencies. 
Uh, the cost optimization should be a major design criterion from the very beginning. And also we should think about a new work approach to centralization, as I already mentioned before, to make it easier for vertical industries to get engaged. So this might require a change of the working procedures in CGBP, for example. And with that, I'm already at the end of my short talk um, about Industrial 5G and a future perspective. Um, I think as Bosch and the vertical industries in general, we jumped on the 5G train a bit late. Um, at the beginning, we were not quite sure what it means for us and uh, how relevant this may become for us, but then we recognized the potential. And I can say we've come to stay. So now 5G will not disappear anymore. And at Bosch, at least, we have the ambition to also be part of the 6G discussions and developments from the very beginning. So therefore, we would be very happy to have these discussions together with you and to jointly shape and drive the developments also towards 6G. With that, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your kind attention. You're watching the 2020 Summit on what next for wireless infrastructure. Our next presenter is Dr. Jordi Jimenez, Head of Technology at the 5G MAG Association, who will be talking about media and beyond 5G, opportunities and challenges. Hello, my name is Jordi John Jimenez, and I'm the Head of Technology of the 5G Media Action Group. We are an association based in Geneva, and we are gathering together stakeholders from the media industry and from the ICT domain in order to evaluate different opportunities that 5G may bring to the media industry. Today, under this presentation, Media and Beyond 5G Opportunities and Challenges, I would like to go through some of the activities that we are, we are uh, conducting and also well, present some of the ideas we have in mind uh, on the future of, of 5G and, and, well, the next steps in terms of wireless IP technologies. So basically at the moment, we are having a look at 5G. We are looking at the opportunities across the entire media value chain, and that involves, for instance, from content creation, where we see 5G playing a role, for instance, in these scenarios in which uh, we need to connect uh, microphones, we need to connect um, cameras, and in the end, we'll take profit of uh, the high performance uh, KPIs of 5G in order to, to be able to deliver such, such use cases. In terms of contribution, we also see a 5G playing a role there. For instance, when you have journalists covering events somewhere, and you can benefit from 5G networks and 5G connectivity in order to get that signal straight away to the studio or to the cloud to do some kind of editing. And actually, in that domain, uh, in the production domain, uh, we see now opportunities and well, even the, the situation with the COVID, we see more and more need uh, to go IP and also to go remote. And then 5G with all the capabilities in terms of uh, guaranteeing quality of service, in terms of low latency, in terms of high bandwidth, well, we see uh, a lot of benefits uh, for, the, for the media industry in these production and remote production scenarios. In terms of distribution, let's say the next step, so uh, putting all this content out for the user, we see 5G playing a critical role in terms of uh, infrastructures, for instance, leveraging cellular, terrestrial, and satellite infrastructures, but also well, getting close to, to the current services that are offered uh, online or over the internet using CDNs. Well, how to improve all those services, how to improve the quality of service, the coverage, and in the end, the, the user experience. And well, final final step in terms of consumption. Well, it's clear that we see an explosion at the moment on all these platforms and applications from uh, well linear TV and radio to on-demand catch-up content, podcasts, and so on, and even more consumed 
everywhere in, in any device. Well, we see here uh, watches, we, we see smartphones, but we also see uh, the role of connected cars with uh, car infotainment systems just getting connected uh, IP. So that's all the different domains where we see 5G and let's say wireless IP technologies uh, playing an important role. And well, just going to the first domain, media production, well, as I said, we see remote production, news gathering, outdoor broadcast, and for instance, also the possibility of using your own networks, your own media campuses or non-public networks for, a, well, arranging your setup of equipment and making use of 5G or, and the features coming with 5G to make uh, this kind of more flexible uh, production uh, setups. So where are we in this domain? Where are we in terms of 5G and content production? Well, uh, in SA1, uh, during release 16, there was some work to onboard requirements for the media industry in order to realize some of the, some of the use cases that where we see 5G uh, playing an important role. And this is now becoming, let's say, more real. So this is now becoming standardized. Uh, we see work going on in network slicing, which is a PHA that, of course, uh, helps in, in that domain, and also in non-public networks. So as I said, the possibility of building your own network with your with your equipment connected to it and, and being able, let's say, to use, to, to leverage the, the properties of 5G. We also see work in release 17 on enhancing this, uh, also on security, for instance, on public networks, uh, timing and synchronization, very important for, for production, and also work on proximity services or this device to device where uh, we also have some, some use cases. In general, well, just to point out one of the key topics that we are that we are uh, looking at is uh, non-public networks for media production, uh, and we see well, we see several steps or several components. Uh, in principle, from a starting from a technology neutral point of view, so you have equipment that uh, is already IP capable, let's say. But well, you keep the existing the existing systems and you just attach them to the existing 5G uh, network or, or 5G infrastructure. But we also see uh, a step forward in, for instance, uh, technology convergence, so that uh, equipment, uh, EMSC equipment, becomes 5G native and is already able to to get connected to to 5G or to get onboarded directly to 5G, making use of all, all the functionalities that, that 5G provides. In that sense, well, and in any case, uh, Spectrum is, is needed, the Spectrum for media production is needed, and well, we are analyzing several several options in, in that domain, well, but recognizing in the end uh, that it's important to to have a, a global harmonization of a spectrum in order to create a big market, let's say, of equipment that is interoperable across uh, different countries and, and across different regions, so that well, we, we end up in in, in global uh, equipment uh, devices and so. On. Important also to have a look at the isolation of data and uh, and let's say to have the possibility to manage uh, the network, these non-public networks, and, and to have control on the traffic, and also on uh, automatization, as uh, well, the complexity of uh, these setups sometimes is beyond the expertise of the media company. So we, we are having a look at all these, at all these uh, aspects. In terms of characteristics and features, well, this is, I think, something that we are starting to see on board it in 5G, and we are sure that it will, this will continue with uh, the evolution of 5G and, and, and towards 6G and so on and so on. We have very particular requirements from, from media production in terms of synchronization, in terms of high uplink throughput that generally 
well, high, high throughput is generally achieved in the downlink, but, but not in the uplink. Uh, we have issues uh, with uh, mobility and, and deployment flexibility. And in the end, well, there are several components that in any case need to be worked more in order to be able to deliver all these use cases that, that we have in mind for a uh, media production. In terms of distribution, we are having a look at different aspects. Uh, well, achieving a scalable distribution with unicast, multicast, and, and 5G broadcast, achieving uh, that, the, that these services are available under mobility and under uh, global coverage. Here, for instance, terrestrial and satellite architectures uh, may play a role in achieving these uh, well, cost-effective network deployments with universal coverage. And we are also having a look at opportunities that 5G or related technologies, let's say, in the in the ecosystem of 5G, may bring to media distribution. Case of edge caching or edge computing, uh, the onboarding or specific of a specific media network functions on the on the 5G network, or the use, for instance, of network slicing for guaranteed quality of service. Where are we? Well, we know under LTE there has been work on onboarding requirements for broadcasting, requirements from the from the media industry for for doing a uh, well linear TV and radio uh, broadcast. This work uh, has finished in release 16 with the so-called LTE based 5G terrestrial broadcast. But well, we see that this does not uh, finish here because well, with 5G new radio and with the 5G core, we also have uh, opportunities to to have a look at how to distribute all this content. We have work on 5G satellite and harmonization uh, or the hybrid integration of satellite and, and terrestrial. We have work going on on media streaming architectures. We have work on, uh, for instance, traffic split across different uh, access networks and even between fixed and wireless networks. And release 17 is already coming with new opportunities, as I said, around multicast and broadcast that we need to follow, understand, and, and in the end, uh, analyze for, for, for being used for, for media distribution. In the end, what kind of services? Well, as, you, as I said, there is a, an explosion in terms of these applications that are available everywhere uh, in, in smartphones in, in cars in even watches and, and so on so content needs to be available anywhere at any time and well for users to be able to consume it uh, using any device and, and when we refer to content we mean uh, of course linear uh, content traditional tv radio also live sports live events and so on also a lot of non-linear content that is consumed uh, and uh, currently and that allows for instance a, a higher degree of personalization uh, towards the end user and as i said different environments uh, for 5g media media distribution are emerging we see consumption at home we see connected cars we see consumption on the move and even uh, well we have here a picture of flight entertainment systems which are also also in the scope and that well, where, where 5G uh, may play may play a role. In the end, all these services would need to be delivered with scalability, with universal coverage, with guaranteed quality of service, regardless of network congestion, uh, interoperability across different networks and different architectures need to be ensured, uh, free access for users when it comes to public service media is something uh, desirable and uh, in the end well having a look at how to sustain distribution cost towards the service providers it's it's another another very important uh, topic in the end looking beyond 5g where we see options for future uh, analysis are on the efficient integration of wireless infrastructure cellular terrestrial satellite um, well, leveraging cloud native approaches, uh, it doesn't make much sense, let's say, uh, for a media company to, to dedicate some development for current cloud systems and not being able to port all of this, for instance, uh, to, to 5G Edge. 
uh, when it comes to, to computing uh, resources. We need, uh, well, we need to continue work on integration and access for the vertical industries, in this case for the media industry, with, uh, well, APIs and with, uh, let's say, with real opportunities to interact with the network and, and to, to bring, let's say, 5G, uh, or to, to, to bring closer 5G to the, to the vertical industries. Automation is also a very important point, given the complexity of the systems, as well as security, trust, and service integrity of the content that, be, that is being put in the 5G network. And that's it. Many thanks. You're watching the 2020 Summit on what next for wireless infrastructure. David Owens, Head of Technical Trials at Telefonica O2 is next with a presentation on enabling a 5G future. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Owens. I'm Head of Technical Trials at Telefonica. And today I'm going to talk to you about enabling a 5G future. So when we think about 5G, 5G is the next uh, step in the evolution of mobile technology. We know that national 5G infrastructure, when it arrives in a few years time, will make a contribution, an additional contribution of 7 billion a year to the UK economy in just six years after rollout. It will be a technology breakthrough that will allow a profound and gradual transformation of industry and society. However, we must consider that 5G to be more than just pure connectivity. It has the potential to transform every sector it touches from transport to energy grids, from manufacturing to social and healthcare, and from education to entertainment. Just spending a moment uh, introducing Telefonica. Telefonica uh, is a company that operates in 14 countries worldwide and we offer services to 100 and, uh, services in 170 countries through other partnerships. We also have extremely large fiber networks in Europe and Latin America, serving 320 million customers worldwide and uh, 34 million of those in the UK. The biggest opportunity for 5G isn't what we do for our customers today. It's how we transform businesses, utilities and companies and critical infrastructure in the future. And that's why we've been working with businesses across all sectors to explore how they can make the best use of 5G so we can bring customer led solutions to the market for each sector. And our work with DCMS on the government projects has really helped inform our view in this space. We believe that helping businesses become more efficient, it will help them protect revenue and growth. We also believe that uh, it will help employees by mobilizing and, power and empowering the workforce, safeguarding and protecting them when, wherever they are. From a customer perspective, it will help serve them new interactive immersive uh, services, which will have greater personalization. 5G comes with three technologies, EMBB, URLLC, and MMTC. Just taking each one of those in turn briefly, EMBB will provide what we called unlimited experiences. This is AR and VR virtual uh, reality experiences and immersive video. URLLC is probably the most exciting of the new technologies and will help deliver great functionality around networks of networks, mobile edge computing, network slicing and private networks. And finally, uh, massive machine type communication, which is IoT for everything. It will allow us to connect thousands of devices rather than hundreds that's been possible today to enhance that machine type communication service that we offer today. 5G NR has five key technology components. The first and most probably important is the, the new spectrum, but not at any cost. Massive MIMO and beamforming helps us increase speed and improve capacity. And then if we think about the next generation core network, it improves um, services 
by protecting vital services and allowing us to provide quality of service around critical communications with services such as network slicing. We need to ensure that it has coexistence with existing services in the past. So services like LTE need to be supported because we can't have a rip and replace strategy. Technology once deployed needs to provide service for maybe up to 10 years. And then finally, cloud optimization, which focuses on software defined networks, network function virtualization and software defined radio helps us provide dynamic uh, network services and flexible services. Going back to the capabilities that I have covered in the earlier uh, in the earlier slides, the first benefit we will see will be around greater capacity and speed offered by EMBB. And this will help enhance the current use cases, particularly around data transfer, uh, AR and VR and HD video, providing speeds between eight and 10 times faster and low latency uh, speeds, which are 10 times faster than before. This will particularly help the gaming industry with uh, companies like Stadia and xCloud benefiting from this. It will support immersive AR remote experts and VR for training and create new staff and customer experiences. Ultra reliable, reliable, low latency communication will open up a whole new range of new use cases, particularly around industry 4.0 with significant benefits to manufacturing. It comes with carrier grade security, mobile edge compute, to allow you to bring the internet closer to the edge to support fast processing of data and allow businesses to act on that information quickly with latency within uh, one millisecond. High resilience, long-term network of networks will allow private networks to seamlessly hand over between Wi-Fi, cellular and satellite, as well as uh, private networks and software defined networks. Network slicing will give you dedicated bandwidth which will be critical for automation of critical applications and services. Whilst I'm sure many of your businesses already have or are planning to use IoT, um, 5G IoT is very much in its infancy. And today, the real backbone of the IoT industry is the enhanced machine type communication of 4G. Massive machine type communication, however, will enable for the first time large scale IoT when everything gets connected, we can instrument our world and this will allow us to understand pollution and traffic congestion and many other things in much greater detail. MMTC has the ability to connect thousands of devices with faster data rates and lower latency. This will have impacts on many sectors and if we think about cities and towns of the future, this will enable traffic control, intelligent traffic systems and platforms, environmental monitoring and connected internet bins, for example. In stores of the future, monitoring goods uh, right the way through the supply chain um, from the shelves, the trolleys, serving this information to staff and customers uh, is also needed. Health, there will be a large scale deployment of trackers and sensors for acute and chronic conditions, which will allow for assisted living and communication between patients and doctors and smart ambulances, improving patient care and outcomes. And for every sector, it is likely to have a significant impact in connecting businesses to their assets and people, enabling them to make decisions faster and drive automation and efficiencies. With all of this additional network, we need to make sure that we're committed to the green agenda. And I can happily say that O2 is committed to being green. Um, in practical terms, we want, to use, we want to be blue by 2025, and that means net zero. And we want to see a 30% reduction in our supply chain in the next five years too. And starting this year, we're on a mission to save energy wherever we can. And we estimate that we can save 6 million kilowatt hours of previously wasted electricity through uh, network power. To put that into context, the UK today has a peak capacity of around 75 gigawatts of generating capacity and an average demand of around 35 gigawatts. So for us, by snoozing some of our capacity layers between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., we can reduce the amount of energy our network uses. We also believe that we can uh, further improve in two further areas, both in travel and domestic living, which are the two highest uses of carbon today. 
By reducing travel through improved networking and conferencing facilities, it allows people to work effectively from home. And this even includes estimates based on the rebound effect where people would then use more carbon at home compared to the carbon that they would have used in the office. And our smart meter uh, program will help customers save energy at home by making them aware of the energy usage and allow them to reduce as required. We believe that this will save up to 43 megatons of CO2 a year. And it's worth just mentioning that O2 has also championed recycling devices with our O2 Recycle program, which is an award-winning device recycling program. Just would like to pause for a moment to talk about standards. Standards make um, it very easy for interconnection between different types of networks and provide interoperability over networks, enabling free movement of trade and equipment and devices. When we think about our standards with 5G, it is quite a complicated web, and it is really important that we support the standards institutes when we think about our 5G networks. The ITU sets out the timeline. 5G PPP has done a great job in disseminating key messages on 5G, and 3G PP is really where the standards get built. Moving on to coverage then, and ubiquity. When I think about the UK landmass, the UK landmass is something like 240,000 square kilometers. Um, the population lives in a very small proportion of that area. And when we look at the challenges that we face providing coverage for the whole of that area, where 100% coverage you know, is our eventual goal, I see three areas of concern. And we will need a wide range of solutions from neutral host to additional spectrum to help deliver in this. So if I go through each of the areas in turn, looking at planning, regulation in dense urban and suburban areas, we need to improve, uh, need to be improved or relaxed, specifically focusing on PPG8, the GPDO and the national planning policy framework. Then turning to in-building coverage or in-building solutions, as I like to refer to them, the IBS of mobile networks. This is a really big problem. And with 5G frequencies not providing good coverage into internal spaces from external locations, we will really have to focus on how we provide in-building coverage. Looking at the industry, there are 6 million SMEs, and this means that it's a sizable problem and probably will mean that we'll need Wi-Fi for the foreseeable future, as it will play a big role in indoor space. Then finally, looking at rural networks, we will need a combination of terrestrial and extraterrestrial networks to fully serve the population and to get to that last you know, 0.1%. And this means that we'll need to integrate with satellite communication systems into our mobile networks. I am heartened to see the great work that SpaceX and OneWeb are doing here, especially now with their Starlink constellation, which has a significant number of satellites in it, approaching 900. Also the work on Wi-Fi on 802.11 and 802.15 is really important too. And the great work that's been done in Leeds University on the terabyte optical wireless solutions by Professor Jeffrey Emagani uh, on the terabyte speed and ultra capacity indoor networks. And also Professor Harold Haas, who continues to focus on Wi-Fi and the 6G Wi-Fi, Li-Fi, I should say, light um, Fi solutions and edge compute. The insatiable demand for data, which we expect to continue into the future, as we see services around HDR video and 8K immersive video services introduced, uh, really challenges our network. And really that's in two areas. First of all, today, the cost of our networks are directly proportional to the number of sites that we deliver. And for 5G, we're predicting that we'll need between five and 10 times as many as we have today. So we will need to improve that technology. And then we would hope that uh, improvements in technology, large scale integration and Moore's law will help us in, with that regard. And we would hope to see the price of base stations coming down towards that, that we would pay for Wi-Fi hotspots today in the future. Thinking then finally about spectrum. Spectrum is really important for us because it allows us um, to deliver the capacity to our network without having to upgrade the site. And if we think about our network, our network is doubling in capacity, sorry, doubling in demand every 18 months. And that means that we need to deliver a whole new network's worth of capacity 
every 18 months, and that can't be at any cost. That brings me to the end of my presentation, and I look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you very much, and goodbye. That concludes the afternoon session of presentations for day one. But don't go away as we'll be back in a moment with our live Q&A panel, your chance to ask questions to our presenters. And I'll be joined once again by co-chair Adrian Scrace, Chief Technology Officer at Etsy. We'll be right back. Yeah.